Hello everyone and welcome to Stress Lesson 5, Workplace Stress. Now, stress in the workplace has been a very, very research topic in the past decade or so, ever since researchers started throwing up some fairly worrying facts about the effect of the workplace on our mental health. So, for example, in 2004, a report revealed that over half a million people in the UK suffered from workplace stress to a degree that they actually believe it's making them ill. Um, millions more work in jobs that they rate as very or extremely stressful, and actually the cost to individuals and to society are enormous. So again, research in 2013 calculate that work-related stress costs the UK economy around £3.6 billion every single year. And because of the high human and financial costs, psychologists are very, very urgently trying to answer the question of what actually causes stress in the workplace, and more importantly, how can that workplace stress be reduced? Now, in the process of conducting such, such research, psychologists have identified several factors in the workplace that create stress and may actually contribute to physical and psychological and behavioural symptoms of illness. And two factors which have greatly attracted attention are workload and control. More specifically, high workload and low control. So these major stressors are linked by a researcher known as Robert Karacek. And his 1979 job demands model of workplace stress kind of explain why. Now, the job demands control model is also known as the job strain model depending on which book you're using um, but they're both the same thing so Robert Karasek suggests that the stressful demands of a job such as work overload can lead to poor health dissatisfaction and absenteeism absenteeism is the tendency to not come into work and just stay at home however the relationship between stress and work overload can be modified by the amount of control the employee has over their work. So, for example, when two people have an equally demanding job, only one of them is likely to become ill, and that is the person who lacks control over their work. Now, obviously, if both of them lack control over their work, then they're both likely to become ill. But let's imagine one of them has control and one of them doesn't. Um, it's the person who doesn't have control over their work that is more likely to become ill. OK, so having control over your workload or over the work that you do actually acts as a buffer against the negative effects of high job demands. That's what the model suggests. Okay, and we've got a couple of research studies into this for you as well. Um, I'm going to give you two. Um, one of them is probably a little bit more important than the other one, but it doesn't really matter. It's completely up to you which one you choose to learn. If you want to learn both of them, of course, then that's completely up to you as well. Okay, so the first study um, is a study that was done by Marmot et al., um, and they were known as the Whitehall studies. There were two studies, Whitehall 1 and Whitehall 2. Now, the Whitehall studies were major investigations into the jobs and health of thousands and thousands of civil servants working in Whitehall in London. And the Whitehall studies were made up of lots and lots of individual little studies that kind of looked at the effects of control or lack of control on, um, on workplace stress. Now, one of those studies that we're going to look at was conducted by Bosma et al., in 1997 and it looks into the effects of control on stress. The study used a detailed questionnaire to measure various aspects of workload and job control. Participants were also examined for symptoms of coronary heart disease and were follow-up after five years. The researchers found no correlation between workload and illness. So, job demands appeared not to be a significant workplace stressor. As for control, the study painted a very different picture. Those employees who reported having low degrees of control at the start of the study were more likely to have coronary heart disease five years later, even when 
other risk factors were statistically accounted for. So risk factors such as lifestyle, smoking, diet, that kind of thing. And that was true across all job grades. So it didn't matter whether you were the lowest earning employee or the highest earning employee, low levels of job control affected those people equally. So the study shows that the status and the support given to higher grade civil servants actually didn't offset the risk of developing coronary heart disease, particularly if jobs lacked control. Okay, so it's a, it's a study that supports the effect that a lack of control has on your perception of workload stress. Okay, so moving on to the second study that I have for you. This particular study is one done by Johansson et al. in 1978. Um, and this study actually supports the effects of both workload and control on stress. Okay, now Johansson et al. used Swedish sawmill workers um, in her study. And she carried out a natural experiment to in comparing two very different groups of workers in a Swedish sawmill. So one group consisted of 14 wood finishers, and it was their job to prepare the timber that came out of the sawmill. Now, the job was repetitive, and the finishers were cut off from the other workers, and because it was dictated by machine, those employees had very little control over their work. However, the job was still demanding because it was very complex, um, they needed to be very skilled, and it carried a lot of responsibility as well because the wages of everybody else on the production line depended on the productivity of the finishers. Now, the second group consisted of cleaners who had a very different role. So they had very much more control over their work. They had greater flexibility. They had more contact with other workers and much less responsibility as well. The researchers measured levels of employee illness and absenteeism from personnel records, and they also measured levels of the stress hormones adrenaline and noradrenaline in the workers, workers' urine, once before they go to work and then three times a day at work as well. Now, what they found was that there was a higher level of stress hormones in the finishers group overall. So the first samples of each day showed that the finishers actually already had a higher hormone concentration than the cleaners, even before they got to work. Also, the finishers' hormone levels increased over the day, whereas the cleaners' levels actually decreased. They also found that there was more stress-related illness among the finishers, and absenteeism levels were also higher as well amongst the finishers. Okay, so the conclusions from that study are that as the job demands control model indicates, both demands and lack of control create chronic physiological arousal, even when we are resting, which in turn leads to the production of stress hormones and the development of stress-related illness as well. Okay, so this study shows very, very well that actually high levels of workload and low levels of control can both contribute to the production of stress-related illness, stress hormones, all of that kind of stuff, um, which can have a negative effect on our psychological well-being. Okay, so compared to the study before, I quite like this one because it shows both of the factors that were mentioned in the job demands control model can have an effect. Okay, so like I said earlier, which one you want to learn, or if you want to learn both of them, that's completely your call. Okay, but they are both very, very good and useful for any outline or any research that you might have to explain in an exam. Okay, moving on to the evaluation section then. I have three evaluation points for you. And the first one we're going to look at is a cultural differences one. Okay, so in 2012, it was found in a cross-cultural study that a lack of control was seen as stressful in individualist cultures, such as the UK and the USA, but actually in collectivist cultures, such as China and a lot of other Asian countries, 
control was considered less desirable. So the very concept of job control might actually be a very Western notion which reflects our ideals of equity, so fairness and personal rights. So it may not actually be generalizable to non-Western cultures because very often collectivist cultures actually prioritize the good of the wider group and the community and the society and so having job control might not be so much of an issue. However, in terms of workload, some research has shown that there are actually some cultural similarities. So Lou et al. in 2007 found no significant difference in terms of the effects of workloads across individualist and collectivist cultures. It was actually rated as the third most stressful workplace stressor in both cultures. So it would appear that workload is a culturally generalizable concept and it's understood as a stressful thing wherever in the world work is done, whereas actually control is something that's more culturally specific to individualist cultures. Okay, moving on. You've got this concept of work underload as well. So most research on work-related stress has focused on work overload or having too many job demands as opposed to work underload. Work underload is the concept that people um, might be employed in jobs that are underneath their capacity or where they're given tasks that are lacking in any kind of creativity or stimulation. It's almost like getting bored at work because you're not being stimulated enough or you're not being used to your full potential. Work underload has been overlooked in studies throughout, really, particularly the studies that we've covered in this video. So research, for example, by Schultz et al. in 2010 gathered data from 16,000 adult employees across 15 European countries, and they discovered that although employees report, reporting work overload had the highest levels of stress-related illness, there were also a very high number of people that reported work underload as well. And those who reported work underload also reported low job satisfaction and significant levels of absence due to stress-related illness. So findings from research like that actually suggests that the job strain model may be an oversimplification of how workplace stress actually works because all it focuses on is work overload and workload, whereas actually there may be other factors involved that it's not looking at. Okay, and then the final point is a little bit of a limitation of the impact of control, and this one suggests that actually too much control can also be stressful. So it's also it's almost taken for granted that a lack of job control control is stressful, particularly if you have a little look at the um, research studies that we've already covered in this video. However, some research actually shows that too much control can also be a source of workplace stress. Now, whether it is or isn't very much depends on what's known as self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is the degree to which you believe you have the capacity to perform the tasks successfully. So can you do the job or can't you do the job? Or more importantly, do you believe you can do the job or do, be, do you believe you can't do the job? Now, it makes sense that somebody who believes they aren't up to the job is going to find having a lot of control over that job a very stressful experience. Now research by Meyer et al in 2008 used a detailed questionnaire to measure feelings of stress at work and they found that employees with a low sense of self-efficacy reported feeling more strain in jobs that gave them more control and the reverse was true for employees with high self-efficacy beliefs as well so low control was more stressful. So what it actually suggests is that people with low self-efficacy aren't capable of taking advantage of the opportunities that having control over your job gives to you. So for example, somebody who has more control, you know, has more choices perhaps, or they have greater scope to make decisions and influence things, etc. That's only going to be good for people who believe they can do the job. People who don't believe they can do the job, so have low self-efficacy, are going to find that very, very stressful. So research like this actually suggests that there's a bit of an individual differences issue going on, 
because actually lots of control in a job is only good for people who believe that they can do the job. People who don't believe they can do the job will actually find lots of control more stressful, which shows that you know, making conclusions such as low levels of control are bad for stress in the workplace, far too simplistic, because that's actually only the case if you have high self-efficacy. Okay, right, those are the three evaluation points that I'm going to give you. I'm now going to put them all up as appeal paragraphs. Um, so you can have a little look at them and make any notes that you want to make. Okay, here we go. There's your first one, cultural differences. The second one, work on the load. And the third one, too much stress and individual differences. Okay, so if you want to take a bit of a closer look at either any of those, then just go back and pause the video. Okay, I hope all of that has made sense. And thank you very much for listening.